Hi, uh, this is Sadashiva Pai from uh, Science Mission. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Ayan Mace from uh, uh, ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai uh, in New York. So he's the assistant professor of neuroscience and uh, pharmacological sciences there. Uh, so Dr. Mace has won several awards to his credit. Uh, I'll name some of them. In 2011, uh, he got Terry uh, Krulwich dissertation award from Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Uh, 2014, he gave a couple of uh, speeches as an invest invited speaker. Uh, in 2015, he won ISMMS nominees, Searle Scholars Program nominee. In 2015, he won a travel award from American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. In 2015, uh, he got a Transforming Mental Health Research Fellowship. Uh, Welcome Trust Charity, and 2015 again he won Ro uh, Rosen Family Research Scholar Award. 2016 Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research Fellowship in Neuroscience, and 2019 Harold Golden Lampert Award in Basic Research. Uh, it's an honor uh, bestowed to an outstanding junior faculty member at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, who shows exceptional potential for making significant contributions over an extended period of time in basic research. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mace, to Science Hangout. Thank you for having me. Uh, can you please talk about yourself, give some information about your background, uh, your education, etc.? Sure. So uh, I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I did my undergrad at the Ohio State University, uh, majoring in microbiology and immunology. Um, mm -hmm. During my time there, I actually did a lot of uh, undergrad research working in a honeybee a neurophysiology lab uh -huh. um, that then got me interested kind of uh, in neuroscience. And so okay. from there, I ended up, um, after I graduated, moving to the University of California, San Francisco, uh, where I was a technician with Ulrika Hebelheim, uh, who's now mm -hmm. at Chain Farm. Um, after that time, I moved down to Dallas, Texas, and started my PhD at the University of uh, uh, University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, um, with my PhD advisor, Eric Nessler. Um, mm -hmm. And then when Eric moved uh, to Mount Sinai to become the director of the Friedman Brain Institute, I moved with him toward the end of my PhD and finished my PhD here. Okay. Um, and then after finishing my PhD, I moved down the street to Rockefeller University, where I did my postdoctoral training with Dr. C. David Ellis, uh, who's the original articulator of the histone code hypothesis. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I moved back here to Mount Sinai uh, as an assistant professor in 2014. Okay. And... Uh Talk to us about your lab, lab people, et cetera. Sure, yeah. So uh, right now I have three uh, phenomenal postdocs, um, one of uh, whose work I'll be talking a lot about today. Um, I also have four PhD students and a uh, lab manager, as well as uh, kind of rotating undergraduate researchers that come through typically uh, in the summer. So how do you mentor them? Like, what is your mentoring philosophy? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think the one thing I was really trained to do early on, starting with uh, my work with Eric Nessler and then into Dave Alice's lab, uh, was really, you know, encouraging people to think big. So instead of just picking, say, your favorite molecule and following that molecule for the rest of your life, I really encourage people to, uh, you know, look at it from a 30,000 foot perspective, um, be willing to take um, risks in your work, um, and, and just to be passionate about it. Um, and so, you know, I, I'd say I'm a, a, a pretty active mentor. I tend to like to meet with my people um, as much as I possibly can, given travel schedules and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think really it's, it, for me, the foundation is just encouraging people to think big, uh, take risks, and be excited about their science. Okay. And other than research, what are your hobbies, interests? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I live in New York City, so... Uh, uh, my, my, my family and I were very uh, excited about going to Broadway shows, uh, museums, things like that. And also, uh, my, my wife and I are, are a bit of wine aficionados. So, <laughs> okay. okay, that's good. And going back to research, talk to us about your projects and you can go and present your work also. Sure, yeah. So, so when I started here at Mount Sinai, uh, you know, I was really trying to figure out what my, my niche would be, right? What would set me potentially apart? 
And because I had done dual training in molecular neurobiology and in chromatin biochemistry, uh, it really led me down to a path where I figured that if we could somehow integrate those two uh, more faithfully than perhaps had been done before, uh, that that would really open up the door. And so I think, you know, my lab philosophy is that we don't really focus on a specific model system. We do study aspects of neurological disease, uh, but we tend to let the very basic chromatin biochemical mechanisms guide us. And so we have projects that range from what I'll talk about today in terms of the discovery of protein monoamine or histone uh, all the way down to looking at uh, models of Down syndrome and, and drug abuse. So, um, you know, we're willing to kind of take uh, risks in all those different directions. Yeah, so you can present your work, share the Okay, so let me go ahead here. Okay. Yep. All right, great. Okay, so so as I mentioned, so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the work that my lab's been involved in over the past, I guess, you know, four and a half years now, mm -hmm. which is focusing on alternative roles for linear hydrophobic monoamine neurotransmitters, so things like serotonin, dopamine, histamine, uh, in the central nervous system. Uh, and so what we've discovered, I'll jump to the chase and then I'll kind of you know, backtrack and show you how we got there. Uh, we've essentially found that uh, numerous proteins in the brain, including histone proteins, which are the proteins uh -huh. that wrap around our DNA, can actually form um, covalent bonds with uh, these molecules, things like serotonin, and they seem to play a very important role in driving uh, everything from neural development uh, to plasticity, and, and of course, uh, they have implications in disease. So I, I just want to start by saying that, you know, none of this work occurs in a, in a vacuum. So uh, I have had the, uh, uh, the luck to work with some of my, my scientific heroes in order to get this work done. And I definitely recommend to everyone that they collaborate as extensively as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I'll be telling you about work today that's a really a grand collaboration between my group and, and with Lorna Fairley, who's a postdoc in my lab, spearheading things. Uh, and also Tom Muir, who's the chair of chemistry at Princeton, along with his postdocs, Robert Thompson and Kelly Chu. Uh, and then also uh, Haitao Li, who's at Tsinghua University in Beijing, uh, and his uh, student, Shua Zhao. And of course, there are many other people, and I'll show an acknowledgement at the end, but we've also worked with Bob Rader, uh, Rusty Gage, Krishna Vadadaria, and, and, and many others. Okay, so just to get started, so how did we kind of get onto this? So coming from a background in, in neuroscience, I've always been, of course, interested in monoamine neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, et cetera. Uh, and, and, you know, when you think about what these neurotransmitters do, you have to understand that when you look at something like serotonin, it plays a, a many diverse roles throughout the body. Everything from being a morphogen uh, during development to an autocoid uh, in the periphery. And then, of course, the way we think about it as neuroscientists as a, a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. And so the basic idea uh, in terms of how we think about these molecules is that you have some neuronal population, let's say the dorsal raphe serotonergic neurons that produce serotonin, that will ultimately release serotonin, uh, which will traverse the synaptic cleft and then bind to these um, uh, membrane bound receptors. And ultimately the way we would think about uh, neurotransmitters regulating uh, say postsynaptic plasticity is that this engagement of the postsynaptic receptors then will lead to these kind of complicated second messenger signaling cascades that ultimately will converge in the nucleus to mediate uh, everything from histone modifications to transcription factor recruitment uh, in order to regulate gene expression that can essentially uh, fine tune the plasticity of those postsynaptic cells. And so when I was finishing my postdoc, uh, a paper came out from Edwin Levitin at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, which is here, this is from the Journal of Neuroscience, where they had a very interesting finding that caught my eye. So what they were doing was they were using uh, very elegant two-photon imaging to try to get at an estimate of how much of the serotonin within a serotonergic neuron in the, in the brain is actually sequestered to vesicles ready to be released in response to a somatic stimulus. And so when they did this, they actually, to my surprise, found that only about 25% of all the serotonin within a given serotonergic neuron is sequestered to vesicles, which left this really large pool of extravesicular serotonin. Now, also in this paper, they did some very nice photo bleaching studies in, in response to stimulation, and they found that not only is serotonin present as this extravesicular form in the cytoplasm of these cells, but also within the nucleus of these cells. Now, to me, this was really, uh, really shocking. So I started to dig through the literature a bit and try to figure out was there other evidence that these molecules could actually exist in the nucleus? And it turns out that if you go back as, as early as, I think, 1971, 
uh, Saul Snyder, Candace Pert, and others had a beautiful paper in Science that was tracking histamine within the cell body and the nucleus to cross mammalian brain development. And they actually found that almost all of the histamine is sequestered to the nucleus during early periods of embryonic brain development. And more recently, there have been some beautiful studies in vertebrates and vertebrates, and they've shown also very high levels of nuclear uh, serotonin pools. Now, the idea in this paper was simply that, you know, you have prepackaged vesicles, you receive a stimulus, you undergo somatic release, and you need to draw upon this reserve pool of extravesicular serotonin to essentially replace the depleted vesicularized pools. So that's a very uh, straightforward uh, idea. And of course, we have observed in our hands in a variety of systems that indeed uh, serotonin, dopamine, and others that we do see these molecules within the nucleus. So the other paper that kind of caught my attention after a conversation with a colleague, Olivier Berton, was this one. This is a cell paper from 2003 from Michael Bader's group at the Max Delbrück in Berlin, where they had shown that in theory, and I'll say, I'll tell you why in theory in a moment, that proteins could be transamidated by a protein called the transglutaminase or the transglutaminase 2 enzyme to actually form covalent bonds with serotonin. Now, the reason I say in theory is that a lot of these earlier studies were, were performed in situ. So let's say, for example, they wanted to look at if proteins could be serotonylated in platelets, which don't produce serotonin themselves, but take it up uh, from the periphery, what they would do is they'd make lysates from platelets. They basically purify a recombinant transglutaminase. They'd add radioactive serotonin to the system. And then they basically IP for their favorite protein and run autoradiography. And when they did this, they did see that certain GTPases, uh, I think rho GTPase, could indeed uh, undergo this process. But again, the physiological relevance of this was really, I think, still in question. And since 2003, um, there's been a lot of papers that have tried to look, I wouldn't say a lot, maybe 25 or so that have tried to look at this process, but they've always kind of been stuck by looking at the in vitro scenario. So performing in vitro reactions and just saying, yes, this can happen, but not a lot of functional relevance described. But in any case, the basic idea behind this mechanism is that you have a, uh, a donor amine containing molecule, in this case, serotonin, um, and you have a glutamine containing substrate uh, in your protein. And essentially in the presence of the transglutaminase and calcium, because it's a calcium dependent enzyme, you can basically form a covalent bond between the carboxyamide of the glutamine and the donor amine of serotonin to form this isopeptide bond between your substrate protein uh, and the donor serotonin molecule. So that's the basic premise. So when I started my own lab, I wanted to get at this idea about, you know, can cells do this on their own? Right, so instead of taking lysates and recombinant proteins, can cells do this on their own? And so what we decided to do based on uh, some very nice literature developing these types of probes is that we decided to basically generate a serotonin uh, mimic. So instead of having the hydroxyl group off the aromatic ring here, you actually now have uh, an alkyne uh, that's placed here. And so this is called propargylated, uh, we call it propargylated serotonin or 5PT. And the idea here was that if we could synthesize this and put it into cells, say HeLa cells, for example, if it could get into the cells, we could then basically use copper click chemistry to attach uh, a, a biotin azide, for example, and then we could immunoprecipitate out those biotin labeled proteins and ask which proteins can this endogenously happen to. And so what we did is after we basically pure, uh, synthesized this molecule, this is just showing you some uh, immunofluorescence from HeLa cells, where we've either added a vehicle or the propargylated serotonin. And then here we're using co copper click chemistry to click on an azide fluorophore, in this case, a GFP uh, type of label or a green label. And you can clearly see that our propargylated serotonin can actually get into the cells. So after this point, we basically decided to perform these large scale screens after immunoprecipitating the proteins that theoretically are being serotonylated to ask what kind of proteins come out in these screens. And of course, we have identified there are many different proteins that appear to be putative substrates for serotonylation. But as a histone buff myself, one of the things that came out in our screens that was very surprising is that histone H3, but none of the other core octameric histones, so H4, H2A, or H2B, seem to be coming out as a putative substrate for this modification. Now, as a person who does a lot of immunoprecipitations, when you pull out histones in these types of screens, you always get a little nervous because they're highly basic and they tend to be a little sticky. Uh, but the fact that we saw specificity for H3 gave us some, uh, uh, you know, some, some, some belief that perhaps this could be real. <laughs> 
So we further delineated kind of where the signal was coming for, uh, coming from for H3. So we actually then took similar cells treated with vehicle or propargulated serotonin, and we basically fractionated them into cytosolic, soluble nuclear, or chromatin-bound fractions, and we were able to find that our signal was indeed actually coming from the chromatin-bound fraction, so that was encouraging. But then to really get at this question, this, this all could be uh, nonspecific. It could be that we pulled out something bound to H3, uh, and so we're just getting H3 signal out. So the next step was to purify histone proteins and directly ask the question, can the histones be monoaminylated? So what we decided to do is we purified histone H3 and histone H4, right, as a negative control. We also purified fibrinogen. This is a, a protein from the literature that's been shown to be serotonin-related. And we performed assays where instead of using serotonin, we're actually using a monoamine mimic or a monoamine analog called monodanzel cadaverine. This is really cool because if it attaches to a protein, you can run a gel like a normal protein gel, but instead of transferring to a membrane, you can put it under UV light like you do with DNA, and you can see your protein band. So what we did here is this is comparing basically in the presence of the donor, MDC, minus and plus the enzyme transglutaminase, that indeed our positive control, we can get a nice signal that H3 shows transamidation and that H4 does not. And to take this a little further for both fibrinogen and H3, we also either added an inhibitor of TG2, cystamine, where you lose the signal, or we were able to compete that signal away with excess donor serotonin. So basically, this was showing direct evidence that histone H3 could be serotonin-related. Okay. So for people that aren't as uh, uh, in the field of chromatin biology, I just want to give a very quick primer on, on chromatin. So as many people are probably aware, chromatin exists as the physiological form of our genome. So obviously within the nucleus, our DNA, which is meters long, has to be packaged in a way to fit into this small compartment. And the way that works is that our DNA is wrapped around these uh, highly basic uh, histone proteins. So two copies each of H3, H4, H2A, or H2B. Uh, and they basically form what's called the nucleosome. So this is about 147 base pairs of DNA wrapped around an octamer of these histone proteins. And this basically will serve as the fundamental repeating unit of transcription in all eukaryotic cells. So just from a semantic standpoint, uh, there are many ways that uh, histones can be regulated. Uh, actually, I just want to go back and point out that uh, within the nucleosome, you of course have your kind of globular domains, but protruding outside of the nucleosome, you have what are, we call these tails. These are unstructured regions of the proteins that of course are heavily prone to uh, post-translational modifications. So histones can be regulated in a variety of ways in eukaryotic systems. Uh, so one is, of course, histone modifications, which I'll talk about almost exclusively today. Uh, also, uh, you can incorporate histone variants, which have small amino acid substitutions, which can affect where they're deposited throughout the genome and what their functional impact is. And then you also have processes uh, referred to as chromatin remodeling. So this is actually the movement of uh, histones along the DNA template, and this occurs uh, through a variety of very interesting mechanisms. So when we talk about histone modifications, we talk about a few classes of associated proteins or, or enzymes that, that can uh, interact with these modifications. So one, we have our proteins that we refer to as writers. So these are the enzymes that can actually put on the histone modification of interest. We have proteins that we refer to as erasers that actually remove them. Uh, and then we have these proteins that are very interesting called readers that have <coughs> specialized functional domains that actually interact uh, in, a, in a very tight fashion with these modifications to kind of promote the transcriptional uh, outputs. Okay. Okay, so, so now going back to the fact that we've now found that histone H3 uh, seems to be a putative substrate that recombinantly, it can be modified in this way. Uh, the first thing we wanted to do was kind of get back at this question about the writer enzyme. So what is actually able to put it on? So as I mentioned in that first paper from Michael Bader back in 2003, they had suggested that a, a ubiquitously expressed protein called the tissue transglutaminase 2 enzyme uh, could serve as the substrate for this modification. So we started by basically performing simple assays, again, in our propargulated serotonin system in HeLa uh, uh, cells, where we either added vehicle, our propargulated serotonin, or propargulated serotonin with an inhibitor of the transglutaminase, and then again performed our immunoprecipitations with blotting for H3 to ask what impact does inhibiting TG2 have on this process. And so you can clearly see here that we can IP H3 um, very efficiently, but in the presence of TG2 inhibition, you essentially lose all of that binding. Now, this kind of shows that TG2 is necessary, but how about is, is it actually sufficient to promote this type of process? 
So we have kind of, uh, one thing I found early on that was kind of surprising is that when you compare two very common tissue culture cell lines, HEC293 T cells and HeLa cells, which I've been focusing on, we actually find that TG2, whereas it's expressed very highly in HeLa cells, is not expressed at all in HEC293 T cells. So this gave us an opportunity where we could potentially add back TG2 to HEC cells and see if a system that normally shouldn't be able to do this now can. And so that's essentially what we're showing here. So again, this is, of course, without any transfection. We're not able to see any um, uh, pull down of H3 with our propargulated serotonin. However, if we add back a wild type form of TG2, we are able to immunoprecipitate H3, so showing that we can basically add back this process. And if we incorporate a TG2 that actually is catalytically dead, we now lose that process. So it does show both a necessary and, a, and, a, and an argument for sufficiency. Um, and of course, we've also now performed uh, uh, you know, direct assays. So originally when I told you about the MDC assays, we've also performed direct serotonin, so, excuse me, serotonin relation assays using radioactive serotonin, where again, we're able to show the same basic effect, which is that our positive control can be serotonin whereas it can be inhibited by uh, cystamine. Uh, BSA as a negative control cannot be, H3 can be, H4 cannot be. And more importantly, if we reconstitute nucleosomes in vitro, so a more physiologically relevant context, again, we can see that we can very nicely serotonolate nucleosomes and compete that away with an inhibitor of TG2. So this is all fine and good, but now we need to know where is the site? Where is it happening? Is it, you know, there are eight glutamines present in H3. So the question is, where does it actually happen? So what we did is we performed a lot of in vitro uh, trans uh, transimidation reactions on histones, performed mass spectrometry, and in doing so, we're able to find that essentially one glutamine residue, which is found in the far end terminal tail of H3, this is a position five, starting from the end terminus, that this glutamine five seems to be the dominant site of histone serotonilation. And we were able to show that if we actually mutate that site to an alanine and reperform our monodensal cadaverine assays, that indeed we lose uh, much of that signal. Okay. Okay. So now we have a, a site. So what do you do in the chromatin field? You make an antibody, right? Now, there's a couple of things I want to point out before I kind of go through this. So again, this is looking at the H3 sequence from the N terminus to the C terminus. This is our glutamine that gets serotonilated. But of course, for anyone who studies chromatin in any context, you know that the adjacent lysine at position four can be mono, di, and trimethylated. And the trimethylated state of K4 is, of course, incredibly important for recruitment of the general transcription factors that allow for transcriptional initiation. Okay, so this got us thinking, you know, when we started building our tools, we originally were going to make an antibody just to recognize Q5 serotonal. But then I thought to myself, what about if we also made one that recognized the combinatorial state? of both K4 trimethyl and Q5 serotonal, this would give us some idea about whether or not there's going to be a combinatorial role for these modifications. So I won't go into this into any depth, but we did make both antibodies. Uh, we've tested them uh, in a variety of scenarios, both in vitro and in vivo. And we can see that both of our antibodies, this is Q5 serotonal alone, of course, recognize the serotonin-related state over unmodified. Uh, and this is just showing you that our dual antibody also does not cross-react, for example, with K4 trimethyl or Q5, but it recognizes the dual state. Okay, and so now using these antibodies, we've also gone back in vivo into both serotonergic cells, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and also into the rodent brain, and now performing um, uh, mass spectrometry, we're able to actually see that these modifications exist in vivo. So this is now showing you basically a trace where we're tracking um, uh, the endogenous peptide. So this is where the K4 is going to be trimethylated and the Q5 is serotonylated. And this is where we're spiking in a synthetic peptide that we made in vitro. And clearly you can see that you're actually able to pull up essentially a mirrored image. So we are able to see that this modification exists in vivo. And that's of course always very important, I think, in these types of studies. Um, the other thing is that we wanted to test the dependency of whether the enzymes that put on serotonin or that put on K4 trimethyl, whether or not the enzymes care if the other modification is there first. And so to do this, again, with Tom Muir and Rob Thompson, we were able to make different types of uh, nucleosomes. So we were able to make nucleosomes that were homogenous for H3K4 trimethyl or those that were homogenous for H3Q5 serotonal. So this can all be done in vitro using express protein ligation. We were able to make octamers and then nucleosomes and basically perform these reactions in vitro and say, for example, if the nucleosomes are K4 trimethylated, does TG2 care about that? Can it still serotonilate the nucleosome or not? And what we found is that it really doesn't seem to care at all. So if K4 trimethyl is there, you can serotonilate the adjacent glutamine. 
The other reverse scenario is whether or not complexes like the MLL1 complex, which puts on K4, does it care if the serotonin is there? And the answer, of course, is no. So it does seem that they can really potentially, uh, not only do we have mass spec evidence that they can exist in vivo together, but we also, of course, have in vitro evidence showing that the enzymes that put them on don't seem to bind. Okay, so now that we have these antibodies and we've tested them in a variety of systems, we started with a very uh, basic question, which is that one, you know, do, are these marks evolutionarily conserved? And then two, where are they throughout the body? So now this is going to be using, uh, this is blots for H3K4 trimethyl Q5 serotonin, so the combinatorial state. And here we're actually looking across a variety of organisms that produce serotonin. So Drosophila melanogasker, the mouse, uh, this is a bonnet macaque monkey, and the human. And we basically see that the mark exists in all these scenarios. But if you look, it's not shown here, if you look in yeast, for example, which don't produce serotonin, you don't see any signal. Now, what's really surprising uh, is that when you start to look across the organs, uh, you know, you see that there's, of course, a lot of brain enrichment. That makes sense because serotonin is produced in the brain. We see a lot of signal in the colon. This makes sense because most of our peripheral serotonin is made from colon. And we also see some uh, expression in all the other tissues. So it's, it's weak in the lung and the liver, but there's some there. We see a little more in the heart, although I suspect that a lot of that signal comes from blood, contaminating blood. But I think the most shocking part is that when we looked across the brain, I fully anticipated that we would only see the mark occur within brain regions that produce serotonin, the dorsal raphe nucleus, for example. But it actually turns out that you see the serotonin signal across all brain regions. And we've now even gone further to sort out neurons and glia from these different brain regions, and we find that it's in all of the different cells which of course begs many questions about how is it getting there? Is this something that's super early developmentally established? Or is there actually a, a system where you can uptake serotonin into postsynaptic brain regions? And we can chat about that uh, toward the end. Okay, so the, the next question is, where where is it in the genome, right? Is this something that is going to be uh, basically promoting H3K4 trimethyl associated functions? Is it gonna be at permissive or active genes? Or is this something that's going to be antagonistic? And to be honest, when I went into this, these experiments, I fully believed that this mark was going to be antagonistic. I thought that if you put a bulky hydrophobic molecule next to this lysine that needs to recruit these proteins in, that surely it's going to kick those proteins off and it's going to be a repressive modification. So we decided to look at this in a, in a variety of systems. So the first system we looked at, this was in collaboration with Rusty Gage and Krishna Bhattacharya out at Salk Institute. Uh, we wanted to look in human neurons, human serotonergic neurons, and we wanted to track as you differentiate pluri human pluripotent stem cells to serotonergic neurons in vitro, what happens to the mark? Do you elevate the signal? And if so, where does it actually go? And so this is just some bright field images showing that indeed, of course, we can differentiate neurons from these pluripotent stem cells. Uh, we performed a lot of IHC and IF analysis to just make sure uh, that indeed we are making a, a relatively pure population of serotonergic neurons. We estimate that about 80% uh, from each of these lines are actually serotonergic neurons. And then taking these cells, we just started simply by blotting, uh, comparing pluripotent stem cells to neurons for both K4 trimethyl and the dual modification. Now, in this case, we see that both the K4 trimethyl and the dual serotonal modification show really dramatic increases in response to differentiation into serotonergic neurons, although perhaps there's a significant increase in the serotonal over that of K4 trimethyl alone. And so we decided then, okay, well, since we get such a robust increase, this gives us a good system where we can form CHIP-seq using our H3K4 trimethyl Q5 serotonal antibody and ask, where is it going and how does it relate to transcriptional outputs related to differentiation. So we performed CHIP-seq again in the pluripotent stem cells and neurons. Again, this is just looking at the total number of peaks called. So you see that you dramatically increase the number of peaks, which makes sense because you're dramatically increasing the amount of the mark. We then tracked where in the genome you actually see these modifications occurring. And of course, they predominantly occur in the promoter. And again, we're able to validate that most of these events in the promoter are increased enrichment events. And this is just showing you kind of a sample track. So this is a, a, a neuron express gene, L of V, L3. You can see clearly that the mark is coming on around the transcriptional start site of this gene. And if you look at another protein that's, say, only expressed in the pluripotent stem cells like Nanog, you don't see any of this increased enrichment. So it kind of started to indicate that, contrary to my expectations, that perhaps this modification could be permissive to transcription.
And so what we did then is we performed what are called odds ratio analysis or a Fisher exact test, where we can overlap our RNA-seq data. So looking at genes that show increased or decreased uh, expression in response to differentiation and overlap those which show either increased or decreased enrichment in the mark. And what we find, it's not a, it's not a hundred percent, but we find that the strongest correlation is that increased enrichment of the modification seems to correlate most strongly with increased expression of these genes. Okay, but it's not an all or none scenario. So to validate this assumption, we now move to the embryonic uh, mouse brain during development, where again we can track scenarios where if you look, say, early in embryonic development at E9.5 versus E17.5, so this is the time period in which serotonergic neurons in the brain develop and start to uh, basically uh, uh, promote long-range projections. This is also a time when you can see that TPH2, which is the enzyme that basically um, uh, is producing serotonin, that indeed we get elevation of, the, uh, of this marker. And just like in the human neurons, we see that as you go from E9.5 to E17.5 in the mouse brain during development, that both K4 trimethyl and the K4 trimethyl Q5 serotonal are both increased in their enrichment. Okay. So next, performing ChIP-seq, again, now for K4 trimethyl and our dual modification, we again find very high levels in the uh, more developed embryonic brain. We also see that most of this is coming from the promoters and that many of these events are increased enrichment events. And what's really interesting here is that when you correlate to gene expression throughout the course of development, now we're able to see very strong associations with gene expression. So in this case, you see that uh, genes that are going to be uh, increased in expression are the ones that show increased enrichment of the mark, and those that are reducing their expression throughout development are showing decreased enrichment of the mark. And in genes that aren't changed, there's basically no significant association. Now, the, the, that's very exciting and it's very promising, but the problem with these studies is that they don't distinguish between K4 trimethyl and K4 trimethyl Q5 serotonal. If you overlap where these differential enrichment events occur, you basically see that the overlap is almost 100% between the two marks. So it was still giving us some trouble about how do we really show that the serotonal mark is permissive uh, and it's not being driven solely by H3K4 trimethyl. So lucky for us, there's another system um, that we were looking into. This is called an RN46A B14 cell system. So this is a rat medullary blastoma cell line that was taken from the uh, ventral midbrain uh, during rat development. So it was taken right before serotonergic neurons start to develop. It was then immortalized. And then they stably transfected it with the brain-derived neurotrophic factor BDNF. Now what's cool about this system is that they basically are proliferating cells because they're transformed. They do produce some serotonin, but if you basically put them under heat shock conditions because of the BDNF being expressed, they actually start to basically become post-mitotic, they produce a ton more serotonin, and they start to form neurites. So they become more neuronal-like. Now, what was cool about this is that when we looked again at our H3K4 trimethyl Q5 serotonal, we were able to see that it's increased in its expression during differentiation. So just like we saw in our human neurons and mouse brain. But when we looked at H3K4 trimethyl, which I don't think is on here, uh, it doesn't change at all. So it was just, a, it was flat. So we thought, okay, this is perfect. We now have a system where K4 trimethyl does not change. Our serotonal mark does. Now we can maybe show that the serotonal mark is doing something to gene expression uh, irrespective of K4 trimethyl. So again, in undifferentiated versus differentiated cells, we perform ChIP-seq for K4 trimethyl, where again, you're not seeing any change in the overall number of peaks being called, versus the dual serotonal mark, where we are seeing this increase. And we're able to then correlate this back to gene expression to ask, what is the correlation in the absence of changes with H3K4 trimethyl itself? And again, we're able to show that the correlation is incredibly strong and positive. So increased gene expression, increased enrichment, decreased gene expression, decreased enrichment. So this gives us a lot of confidence that H3K4 trimethyl Q5 serotonal is likely indeed permissive. And there's some other interesting things we did um, just to look at you know, what, what happens if you start to manipulate the serotonal mark in these cells. So again, we use the RN46 cells pretty much because they're easier to work with than everything else we were doing. And what we decided to do here is uh, basically take um, these cells. So this is undifferentiated state. This is now RNA sequencing data. So looking at gene expression. We also took these cells and during differentiation overexpressed a wild type H3.3 or H3 protein, which can be serotonin and we also, in another set, expressed the H3.3 where that glutamine has been converted to an alanine. So it can't be serotonin-related. It acts essentially as a dominant negative. So it will reduce the ability to, uh, it will reduce the ability to induce that modification during differentiation. 
And when you do this, what you see is that by basically limiting the amount of serotonin relation in these, in these cells during differentiation, that from the RNA-seq standpoint, they're actually starting to convert back to what looks like more of an undifferentiated state from a transcriptional standpoint. If we inhibit TG2, we get a very similar effect to what we're actually seeing with the Q5A as predicted. So it, again, another way to reduce the modification. And what's really interesting is that when you add this Q5A to compete away the serotonin mark, you actually force the cells into a more undifferentiated state. So here we're looking at the full difference in neurite outgrowth. And essentially when they can't serotonolate during differentiation, you're reducing the overall neurite outgrowth. So we have a feeling, we still need to show this, I think, in different systems, but we have a feeling that not only is this mark being established to promote permissive gene expression, but if you aberrantly inhibit it, that you'll block the differentiation state, or you'll at least reduce it. Okay, so we've gotten to the point of now, I think, unambiguously showing that this modification exists, showing that TG2 is indeed the enzyme that writes this modification. Uh, all the way to showing that it seems to associate or correlate with permissive gene expression. So the next question is, how could it do that, right? I told you in the beginning that I was convinced that if you put this bulky hydrophobic molecule next to K4, you're going to kick off everything that normally binds to it. So to get at this, what we decided to do is basically synthesize histone tail peptide, so the far end terminal tail of H3, put a biotin uh, tag on onto it, and then we basically chemically modified them in a variety of ways. So we had four different types of biotin labeled histone tail peptides, either unmodified, Q4 trimethylated, Q5 serotonin or those that had the dual mark that we're looking at. We then basically can add our, we can conjugate our biotin labeled peptides to streptavidin beads. We can stick them into nuclear extracts of our choice. In this case, we just started with HeLa soluble nuclear extracts. And then essentially using streptavidin, you immunoprecipitate out your peptide protein complexes and perform mass spectrometry to ask what comes down with these marks and how are they affected under the different states. And so in doing that, we saw some really interesting things. So first thing we did is we compared H3K4 trimethyl binders to the unmodified tail because this is such a heavily characterized modification, we knew what we should be finding. And long story short, we found all the binders that everyone has always found, so that gave us a lot of a sense of security that we were doing the right thing. The next thing we did is we asked, of these K4 binders, so this is a volcano plot showing all of the H3K4 tri trimethyl binders, we asked, what does the impact of Q5 serotonin have on these interactions? So everything in gray are K4 trimethyl binders, so enriched over unmodified, that are not changed by the presence of the serotonin mark. The things in red are the things that are either increased or decreased in their overall enrichment or binding by the serotonin mark. And then very surprisingly, you can see there's a lot of things attenuated, a number of things potentiated, but surprisingly, we pulled out basically the entire general transcription factor complex TF2D as showing an increased binding in the presence of the dual serotonin mark versus K4 trimethyl. And this, again, very surprising to me. We validated that TF2D subunits are actually increased in their binding, so this is now performing peptide IPs from the extracts and blots. You can clearly see that for every subunit we looked at, TAP, the, the TBP or TATA binding protein and all of the associated TAFs that indeed compared to K4 trimethyl, when you add the serotonin, you dramatically increase the amount being pulled down. And this is just quantified here. We also showed that if you purify the TF2D complex itself, so in this case, we're basically using a flag tagged TBP expressing HeLa cell line where we can purify TBP that comes down with all the TAFs. And again, on a purified complex, we again can show that in every case, the binding is stronger when you have the serotonin mark in conjunction with H3K4 trimethyl. So the, the next question then is, well, okay, that, that's fine and good, but what, what is causing that? So in this figure, I'm showing you that all of them are showing increased binding. So what in this protein complex could actually be facilitating this increased interaction? So there is one protein within this uh, in this complex, it's called TAF3. And TAF3 has a plant homeo domain, one of these reader domains <laughs> that I mentioned, that is already known to be a very strong interactor with H3K4 trimethyl. So of course, we thought to ourselves, this is a good place to start. If it already is known to bind to K4 trimethyl, maybe somehow it's being influenced in its interaction by the presence of Q5 serotonin. So the first thing we did is we actually purified the plant homeo domain of TAF3, so purified a recombinant protein, and we decided to perform isothermal titration calorimetry where we could test directly the interaction between the PhD finger of TAF3 and our different modified or unmodified histone tail peptides. 
So this is what you're looking at here. These are the ITC traces. The most important thing to look at is the KD. So remember KD, the lower the KD, the higher the binding, right? And so you can see here that when you just look at your K4 modified states, you see an increase as you go from unmodified, so 21 micromolar, to, mono, to uh, uh, monomethylated, 1.81 micromolar, to dimethylated and trimethylated, you see huge increases in binding. This is what's been shown before in the literature. But what was really surprising is that when you look at, say, unmodified versus serotonolated, or in any of the methylated states with the serotonin, we're able to see basically increased binding. And if you look at the difference between, say, K4 trimethyl and our dual serotonal with K4 trimethyl, it actually is about a ninefold increase in binding overall. So this supports the idea that TAF3 itself may be driving some of this increased recruitment. So with our collaborator uh, at Tsinghua University, they were able to actually solve the crystal structure for the interaction between this K4 trimethyl Q5 serotonal histone peptide and the TAF3 plant homeo domain that definitely assured us that they do interact directly, so they're not kicking each other off. But the unfortunate thing was, when we actually traced the electron density, we didn't get good electron density around the serotonal molecule. So the reason for this is likely that, you know, K4 trimethyl sticks within the binding pocket. The Q5 serotonal is probably out on the surface, and it's relatively flexible. So it's moving around. It may be pr promoting some kind of avidity effect, but it's not directly sticking into the pocket to promote this increased interaction. So Hightow and, and all of our colleagues performed some beautiful follow-up experiments to try to figure this out a little more. So in this case, they actually performed NMR spectroscopy, which allows us to look at chemical shifts based on heavy labeled nitrogens in the TAF3 protein between our K4 trimethyl or our duly modified state. And you can, of course, see here just by looking at the two states that there are many uh, amino acids that show pretty large chemical shifts. And using these data, you can then model what the, what the structure would likely be. And so long story short, what we think is happening is that normally these tryptophans, right, around the H3K4 trimethyl, which is bound deeply into a binding pocket, normally they form basically an aromatic cage. So they're kind of enclosing the K4 trimethyl molecule within uh, the structure. And what we think happens is, is when you add this Q5 serotonal, you're in essence increasing uh, the avidity with that, with that aromatic cage, or actually completing that aromatic cage. And so our current hypothesis is that this is how this is working, and we're now performing a number of mutational studies to figure out uh, if this is really the case. But I think, in any case, we now know that TAF3 is a direct interactor uh, and, and shows potentiate interactions in the presence of serotonylation. So the current model, uh, before I go on to the next part, uh, which is shorter, uh, is that essentially, you know, you have, uh, during development, you have your normal patterns of transcriptional regulation by H3K4 trimethyl. Uh, the mark is deposited by things like MLL and SET1. This, of course, causes recruitment of reader proteins, in particular the pre-initiation complex, to promote normal permissive transcription during development. However, in certain cells in the body, you also will have the ability to transamidate with serotonin these K4 trimethylated sites, that we think that this is going to increase the recruitment of these reader proteins, and in particular TF2D, and this will potentiate transcription throughout development. Now, the question though, of course, is if, you know, if this is the case that it's driving the enhancement of gene expression, would it also have an, an effect on the ability to remove H3K4 trimethyl? Because H3K4 trimethyl, when it's established in development, it needs to stay there because once genes are on, you need those genes. They may need to be fine-tuned, but you ultimately want them to be on. So we started to test this idea that maybe the demethylases that take off K4 are going to have problems interacting with that modification in the presence of the serotonin. So getting back to my original idea that maybe it kicks things off. So we tested this in a variety of ways. So the first thing we did is perform multi-TOF mass spectrometry. So in this case, we started with either a K4 trimethyl peptide, or we started with a K4 trimethyl Q5 serotonal peptide. And we performed recombinant histone demethylation reactions. So in this case, we're using a purified KDM5B, which takes off H3K4 trimethyl. And we tested to see if you have the serotonal there, does it impact the ability to demethylate the K4? So you can see on the normal K4 peptide that you can demethylate it very rapidly. So by the time you get to four hours, most of it's unmodified, some of it's monomethylated. But when you look at the serotonylated peptide, it's stalling out in the, di in the um, dimethylated state. Okay, so it implied that maybe having the serotonin there can block this interaction. But to take this the next step, 
Tom Muir, who basically makes what's called designer chromatin, it's really a beautiful process, um, they essentially decided that they were going to make nucleosomes that were modified in these different ways, so oligonucleosomes, where they would either be homogeneously H3K4 trimethylated or homogeneously dually modified with both the trimethyl and the serotonin mark. And they decided to perform demethylation reactions on the nucleosomes themselves because it's more biophysically relevant. Now, in this case, we're looking at the production of H3K4 monomethyl as a readout for demethylation of the trimethyl state, so trimethyl to monomethyl. So clearly, you can see that when you perform these reactions on K4 trimethylated nucleosomes, that you very quickly demethylate them. But what's really amazing is that when you have the serotonin in the context of nucleosomes, it completely eliminates all demethylation. Okay? Taking this one step further, we can test the dependency of, uh, within the demethylases, their own plant homeodomains, which normally bind to adjacent unmodified nucleosomes that stimulate their activity on the nucleosome of interest. So what they did here is they made all of these different sets. I'll take you through it very carefully. So we either have nucleosomes where you have K4 trimethylated and the adjacent nucleosome is unmodified, and this is an oligonucleosome. You have some where it's K4 trimethylated, but the adjacent nucleosome, the tail has actually been cleaved. So the PhD finger that normally binds to it to stimulate its activity, no longer will be able to stimulate its activity. We have some where we decided to put K4 trimethyl and Q5 on different nucleosomes. So asking the question, do they need to be together or can they be just adjacent to one another? And then we also made the duly modified state again with the adjacent uh, full length tail or the truncated tail. So there are two major points to this figure. So the first major point is that we were able to show the dependency of that PhD finger to stimulate the activity of this demethylase. So this is now showing basically um, this situation. So if K4 is trimethylated and then the adjacent nucleosome is unmodified, that you get your normal demethylation. But if you truncate that adjacent nucleosome, you lose it, right? Or you're reducing the signal. But again, when you have serotonin there, it's completely gone. So this implies that the PhD finger itself, which stimulates the activity of demethylases, cannot overcome the antagonism by the serotonin mark. And then interesting, that love, the last point is, is that if you put serotonin and the K4 on adjacent nucleosomes, so they're not together like here, if you put them adjacently, you can still demethylate. So it implies that they really do have to be literally right next to one another. And then the final experiment here was that we actually looked at this in a, in a, in a physiologically relevant context where they performed or generated um, oligonucleosomal substrates that are K4 trimethylated or duly modified. They then biotin labeled them and we stuck them into nuclear extracts where there are demethylases present, pulled them out and asked the question, what is the impact of these marks? And again, in a more in vivo-like scenario, K4 trimethyl can still be demethylated by dipping into extracts, but the duly modified state cannot. And so the way that we think this works is that normally these demethylases, so this is a larger fam a family of demethylases that take off K4 trimethyl, within these demethylases, there's a conserved aspartic acid residue at this position here at 312. And normally what we find is that this aspartic acid actually forms a hydrogen bond with the glutamine that gets monoaminylated. Therefore, if you serotonilate that glutamine, no longer can the demethylase interact with the glutamine, and therefore you get steric hindrance, and it causes the demethylase to kick off. So now we have this kind of larger scenario where the, pres the dual presence of K4 and Q5 serotonal not only potentiates the recruitment of things that promote permissive expression, it also kicks off things that prevent the expression. Okay. Uh, and so I'll, I'll go through this part very quickly, but I just want to mention I've been talking a lot about these combinatorial states, but I do want to point out that we have evidence that Q5 serotonal can exist also in the absence of K4 trimethyl. So we have uh, both uh, mass spectrometry data to this effect in cells, in serotonergic cells, and we've also performed chip sequencing with Q5 serotonal in our RN46 cells during differentiation. Now, what's really interesting about this is that when we compare genes that are, say, induced in their expression during differentiation versus those that are repressed or unchanged, we, of course, see that Q5 serotonal can see the mark as a transcriptional start site, probably in conjunction with K4 trimethyl. But now we see that the single mark also shows up in the gene bodies. And this is surprising because the dual modification does not show up in the gene bodies. Not only does it show up in the gene bodies, but it seems to enrich quite heavily along exons. 
And so this type of exonic enrichment looks a lot like another histone modification, H3K36 trimethyl, which is one of these interesting uh, modifications that's both involved in alternative splicing and also is a repressive modification within active genes. And that's essentially kind of what we think may be happening here. Okay, so now we want to test that a little bit further. So again, going back to our peptide P experiments, we wanted to now compare Q5 serotonal binders, so no more K4, versus unmodified, and say, are they the same binders that bind when K4 is trimethylated? And the answer is no. H3Q5 serotonal outside the context of K4 trimethyl, which again we find in gene bodies and exons, recruits two different complexes. One is the spliceosome. So I just mentioned, very interesting that we see this pure exonic enrichment. So the fact that we're pulling out a lot of the spliceosome is potentially interesting. And also we pull out the repressive NERD complex. Again, perhaps supporting the idea that if you Q5 serotonylate histones within gene bodies of permissive genes, then maybe you're controlling a repressive response within highly expressed genes. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. The other thing, of course, that's interesting, given the fact that we recruit the NERD complex, which contains a lot of DNA methyl binding proteins, the MBDs, we also wanted to check and see what is the impact of Q5 serotonal on the DNA methyl transferases themselves. Because as you may know, DNA methylation within the gene bodies of active genes is also thought to be repressive to control rates of transcriptions of highly expressed genes. So we tested this in a variety of ways, again, performing peptide Ps and blotting for things like DNMT3A, 3B, and 3L, where essentially we find that it, the, the presence of Q5 serotonal does not seem to impede the binding versus unmodified. And again, with uh, Shua Zhao and uh, uh, Haitao Li, we were able to solve the crystal structure for this interaction. So this is now the ADD domain of DNMT3A. So this is part of what allows for its binding to histone proteins. And there's this really cool effect where normally, in the presence of, say, an unmodified histone tail, this glutamic acid and this arginine form a hydrogen bond. But when you insert the Q5 serotonal, even though it's not overall affecting the binding, it causes this arginine to kick well outside of the pocket and you form new hydrogen bonds with the serotonin molecule itself. So for us, this provided some thoughts that maybe the presence of the serotonin would actually allosterically regulate the activities of that protein. And so that's exactly what we find. So this is now purifying either DNMT3A directly or the DNMT3A3L complex and performing peptide spike in assays. So the idea here is that if you test DNMT3 activity or methylation capacity on, on a uh, unmodified substrate, a CG-rich substrate, if you spike in an unmodified histone tail, it actually increases DNMT3 activity. And this has been shown before. If you spike in a K4 trimethylated peptide, you don't see that increase in activity. But much to our, our surprise, but it, it enjoyment, we found that if you spike in the Q5 serotonal peptide, either with the full-length DNMT3A or the complex, you dramatically increase the activity of DNMT3A. So we have this kind of working model. We still have much work to do on this, which is that perhaps what's happening is that Q5 serotonal gets deposited along exons and highly expressed genes, that this does not perturb the ability, but instead stimulates the activity of DNMT3A3L to lay down DNA methylation within these genes. Simultaneously, you get recruitment of the NERD complex, which will stabilize the binding of the DNA methylation. And so the thought is, is that maybe this basically restricts cryptic or inappropriate gene expression within those highly expressed genes. But this is something that we have to figure out. And so just to end in the last few minutes here, I just want to talk about the big picture. So we've done a lot of work with serotonin We have a lot of ongoing work in that area. But I want to point out that we now have mass spec evidence for the existence of all the other linear hydrophobic monoamines. So we know that histones can also be dopamine-related at Q5, norepinephrine-related, histamine-related, okay? Even trace amines like tryptamine, tyramine, octopamine, they all can do this. And what's really cool, and this is something that my, new, my uh, student Sasha Fulton is working on, non-endogenous hydrophobic amines can also transaminate proteins, not necessarily histones, but they can transaminate proteins, and phetamine being one example. Now, to me, this is just... I don't know, kind of scary. You think about all the drugs that are on the market for a variety of scenarios that, you know, we think about them working through these receptor ligand interactions, but is it possible that certain types of molecules actually directly monomenolate proteins in our body to regulate their function? So that's, uh, you know, more, more to come on that.
And I, I don't want to go through this in any detail other than to say that we're now looking at this in a lot of in vivo context. Uh, so my student, Ashley Gleepak, has a beautiful story in Revision at Science right now, uh, which is focused on how histone dopamine elation and the dopaminergic neurons of the ventral tegmental area, how they're affected by exposure to drugs of abuse like cocaine, heroin, et cetera. Uh, where she sees that not only does withdrawal from chronic drug administration lead to significant increases in these marks, but if we inhibit these increases, we can block relapse vulnerability. So I think this is a very exciting frontier, a very different role for dopamine in the context of drug abuse. We're also, of course, looking at things like histone serotonin in the context of stress, uh, you know, the regulation by antidepressants where again, we can see that, for example, animals that have undergone chronic stress and withdrawal from that stress show increases in these serotonin marks. Antidepressants can reverse these types of responses and we can mimic that through mutational uh, studies uh, in vivo. All the way down to looking at histamine elation in the tuberomammillary mammillary nucleus, this is Ryan Bassel's work in my lab, that shows that this mark, unlike the others, cycles in a perfect circadian pattern in this brain region. And this is really cool because it also implies to me that there must be an active mechanism to remove these marks, which is something that we still are pretty unclear about. And we have a really cool mechanism uh, that I won't go into. And so the, the, the final question, of course, is where do we go from here? You know, I'm uh, obviously a histone fanatic, but, you know, monomines are all over the cell. They're very important for a variety of functions in the nervous system. So the question was, are there actually additional substrates of monomine elation in the brain and what could they potentially be doing? So again, now in collaboration with Rob Thompson and Tom Muir, they were able to help us develop a probe, a chemical probe that will allow us to basically click on this probe that'll be biotin tagged to any endogenously dopamine-related substrate. So any protein, no matter what compartment in the brain that's dopamine-related, we can put our probe in, it'll allow us to basically pull out these proteins and then test for functional significance. So now using this probe, this is just an example. We obviously started by looking at the dopaminergic brain region, the ventral tegmental area. We made nuclear lysates. And of course we wanted to look for our, our protein that we know gets uh, dopaminolated, which is H3. And we tested and you can clearly see that when we use our probe, we pull out a lot of endogenously dopaminolated H3. So that was a good control. But since that time, Ryan and Andrew Stewart in my lab have done a lot of nice work uh, to sort out either VTA nuclei uh, uh, and other compartments to try to run mass spec screens and figure out what's being regulated. And we've got lots of very interesting targets, a lot of them chromatin associated, things that regulate transcription. So one example is this protein Crest. It's part of the neuronal swi sniff chromatin remodeling complex. It's heavily glutamine rich and it also is being dopaminolated. So that's an interesting target we're looking at. But taking it further than that, I think for most neuroscientists who think about these things at the synapse, we also wanted to test to see what could be potentially dopaminolated at dopaminergic synapses. So in this case, what we did is we went to the region of the brain, one of the regions of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, that receives projections from those dopaminergic neurons. We actually make synaptic neuros, uh, neurosomal preps, so we enrich for synaptic proteins as shown here. And then again, we performed our dopaminal probe experiments to say, are there synaptic proteins that get dopaminolated? Now, taking that further, not only do we want to see if there are just endogenous substrates, we want to see how those substrates are regulated by things that regulate dopamine signaling. So in this case, for example, we put animals through heroin self-administration. This is something that will dramatically affect dopamine release dynamics. And then we compared the binding profiles or the enrichment profiles of dopamine-related proteins uh, between control and heroin self-administering animals. Now, this is probably hard to see, but you can see, of course, we pulled out hundreds of putative substrates for dopamine elation both in the VTA nuclei and also in the nucleus accumbens synapse. But you can see, this is one example, there are also many proteins that show elevated dopamine elation in the nucleus accumbens synapse in response to heroin self-administration. So that's definitely very interesting. And one of those proteins that really has caught our eye and we're studying uh, a lot these days is this protein called CAM kinase 2 gamma. Now, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the CAM kinases, but CAM kinase 2 gamma in the brain serves a very interesting role. So CAM kinase 2 gamma, can be phosphorylated by CAM kinase 2 beta at the synapse, okay, in response to L-type calcium channel signaling. CAM kinase 2 gamma, once it's phosphorylated, also can then shuttle its way to the nucleus, carrying calmodulin with it, okay, to activate the signaling cascade that ultimately promotes Krebs transcription, which is incredibly important for activity-dependent or immediate early gene expression, et cetera. So we were really excited that maybe the dopamine, the hyperdopaminylation of chemokinase 2 gamma 
in the response to heroin self-administration, then maybe this could be influencing that state or that shuttling. So the first thing we need to do is figure out where in the world is it being dopaminolated. So again, we go back to our classic approach. We purify cam kinase 2 gamma. We perform our in vitro serotonin assays, and we ask where it is. And what we found uh, was super cool to me is that there's only one glutamine in this entire protein that's being dopaminolated. It's at position 285, which sits in the calcium calmodulin binding domain. And of course, that, that theranine that gets phosphorylated that causes it to shuttle to the nucleus, it's only two amino acids away. So this really makes me think, if you dopaminolate this, are you going to influence the ability to phosphorylate? Are you going to increase or, or reduce it? What is the impact going to be? And so this is something now that we're devoting a lot of time to. So I think clearly there is an enormous amount to be done. Um, you know, we're very excited about this. We, you know, the, kind of the initial discovery, we're still trying to figure out if things take it off. We're still trying to figure out better methods to allow us to look at these things in vivo, to manipulate them in vivo. Um, I just want to point out one thing before I show the acknowledgements, which is that in collaboration with Yael David, who's a, a brilliant new professor at uh, Sloan Kettering just down the street, that we've been using this novel uh, approach of in-team chemistry. I won't go into too many details, but the idea is that we can use this chemistry to essentially allow us to generate de novo in living cells. And in this case, this is actually in the brain. We can generate modified histones. The goal being, if we wanted to test, for example, does increased dopaminolation in the VTA neurons, does it actually promote drug vulnerability? Wouldn't it be great if we could de novo synthesize it when animals have gone through self-administration, promote it and see if we can potentiate these types of behaviors and transcriptional responses. And so this is something uh, that we're, we're very, very excited about. And so, um, so on that, of course, I'm happy to, to take your questions. Uh, this was uh, unfortunately a failed, uh, uh, cover illustration that we did for uh, for our nature paper. Um, I thought it was pretty clever. This was done by Alexi Shoznev. Uh, this is a king and queen, so lysine and glutamine. You can see the tripartite fleur de lis for K4 trimethyl in our uh, uh, our, 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 our serotonin-like flowers here. Uh, and anyways, I just want to basically thank everybody that has done this work. Again, none of this work happens in a vacuum. My lab uh, is amazing. My collaborators are, are, are phenomenal. And of course, I've had to receive a lot of funding in order to uh, carry out this work. So on that, uh, I will end and, and take the questions. Okay, so let me see. Let me see if I can, yeah. Yep. Okay. Are we back? Yep. Okay. So I can see yourself. I can see myself. Yeah. Okay. Great. It's a really interesting work. I mean, like right. initially you talked a lot of stuff on the real biochemistry part of it and yeah. uh, clinical applications, how it affects eventually. Like you showed some of the uh, the data, which uh, is going to be published pretty soon in some of the renowned you know, journals. So I have hopefully, a couple hopefully. of fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, th th that's good. I mean, like uh, those are the questions I had when you went through the all these uh, serotonin and all those things. Sure. So well, I have a couple of questions. Like, uh, looks like this enzyme, like transglutaminase, is kind of like really critical in doing all these things. Yeah. So is there any data or literature to show that that is kind of like affected in certain disorders, neuropsychiatric disorders or new Yeah, so 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 this this protein the tissue transglutaminase 2 is a really complicated enzyme. So, you know, of course it can do this, it can transaminate proteins. Um, it also can deaminate, so it can convert glutamines to glutamic acids. Yeah. And most importantly, I think physiologically cross-link proteins, it cross-links glutamines and lysines, and it's very, it's critically important for um, apoptosis. So this is why actually in studies where we've tried to knock out TG2, it's mm -hmm. a problem because it kills the cells. You can't, yeah. you can't do it. Um, now, having said that, TG2 is implicated in a variety of disorders. Um, of course, it is the autoantigen and celiac disease, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in terms of neuronal disorders, most of it's been focused on neurodegeneration. Um, so there are links between TG2 uh, mutations and Parkinson's disease, um, which could be interesting given monomutilation. Um, it's certainly involved, there, there's some implications in, in beta amyloid uh, plaque production. So yeah, it's implicated in a lot, but it's a really hard enzyme to study. And the other thing about it is it's a very promiscuous enzyme. So we, we're, we've had a really hard time trying to figure out how it picks what its substrates are going to be, because it doesn't just monomutilate everything. 
the yeah. monoamine, monoamine lays certain things. Um, and so again, in Tom Mears' lab, they've done some beautiful work, alanine scans and so forth, and they've shown that it, as long as the glutamine's there, it doesn't care what's around it, basically. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's just it's one of these interesting things. I suspect that it's probably in a, in a, in a complex that causes it to get recruited to certain places, but um, again, we have a lot of work to do to figure out what it's actually doing. Yeah. Okay, and the uh, other question is like, uh, again, like with all these neurodegenerative disorders, you have oxidative stress and all. Sure. So, and your dopamine, serotonin, they might be in terms of, uh, they could be easily oxidized or uh, this thing. Yeah. So how does that play? Like, I mean, like you have the serotonin in there, like attached to your glutamine and all those things. Sure. Does the cell's oxidative state changes, like when you add glutamine, glutathione or something like that, does it change the... Yeah, I mean that's that's it's a good question. I mean, you know, I mean for, for the for the nuclear pool, I mean one thing to keep in mind is that the, that the nucleus is a highly reduced environment and the monoamine oxidases don't exist in the nucleus. So I think if the serotonin can get there, it's somewhat safe or the dopamine can get there, it's somewhat safe. The big question I have is, you know, when we're talking about a postsynaptic neuron showing these marks, which we do have data for, how does that work? Because let's say that it comes in through the synapse how does it get to the nucleus without being completely destroyed? And, and this we just don't know yet. We're still, I, I have a feeling that there's going to be a, a carrier molecule, kind of like with Kim Kinase 2 gamma and calmodulin, that maybe there's something that can sequester and protect these molecules on their way to the nucleus. Uh, but th at this point, yeah, we, we don't know. Um, we don't know about that. We are starting, we have, we've just established a nice collaboration with Vivian Labrie uh, and Van Andel to start looking at Parkinsonian uh, tissues. And so uh, hopefully we'll start to get an idea in the context of neurodegenerative disease, what's actually happening uh, with these with these marks as well. I think that's about it. I think, uh, oh. thank, th thank you very much, Ian Mace. So I really appreciate your time and effort. And uh, this will be online pretty soon within next 24 hours. Like you can see, I'll send you a link too. Okay, so, perfect. So again, thank you very much. It is really inspiring work and uh, I look forward to see more of your stuff in the uh, renowned journals. Okay, my, my, my pleasure, happy to do it. Good, good, good luck again. All right, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, bye. Bye.